This Week in Know How, we're looking at your feedback, and then I'm going to teach you how to build a free NAS. Woohoo! Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Welcome to Know How. It's the Twitch show where we bend, break, build, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, and I'm joined by... I'm Patrick Norton. Yeah, that's right. Patrick Norton of Twitch and Techzilla mm -hmm. fame. We're going to be talking about free NAS. And I thought, hey, you know, there's there's really no one that I'd more have on the show than Patrick Norton when talking about free NAS. Well, I, you know, I, I'm actually kind of excited myself. We just did on Die Trium. We did a free NAS build a few weeks ago. It's a show I do with a guy named Michael Han. And uh, we've also made donuts on the show. We're <laughs> kind of all over the map on this one. It's really fun. Um, we actually got to meet some of the developers. No so way. we're going to actually try to get a bunch of the developers on to get really deep. There is so much going on in free NAS. If you keep it simple, though, you can build an amazing bomb-proof uh, NAS for free. That, that's what I love about it. I mean, it, it is something that a beginner can pick up mm -hmm. and literally have installed on a box yes. in 10 minutes. I mean, yes. no problem. Have it up and running. But it's it's an enterprise-based solution. I could install ZFS, get a, a, a set of really nice high-end driver arrays right. and, and run it for my enterprise. Well, it, it's kind of like, in, people do actually use it in enterprise environments with huge disk arrays that are storing terabytes and terabytes, bordering on petabytes of data. And there's kind of a decision you have to make early on. Do I buy inexpensive hardware or recycle an old box? Or do I want to go ZFS in the full-on badass high-end configuration, which is going to require memory and a decent processor and spending more money? Now, we're going to save that for later. But right now, Patrick, I want to introduce you to what I believe is the best dang community in the tech world. That's the know-how community, the know-it-alls. Now, they've got some feedback from us, some questions that they've been sending us in our Google Plus group. Uh, Brian, you want to bring up the first one? Sure. If, you know, if you're ready to do your job at some point. Thanks, there you go. Now, this one came to us from Mike. Mike, if you'll zoom that up a little bit, said, so I've just finished watching episode 76 today about Wi-Fi settings. What Padre never mentioned is, when adding additional APs, should the SSIDs be the same or not? Also, he mentioned using additional routers with DHCP off instead of actual APs, which I thought may confuse some folks. With a router, you can wire to your existing LAN with the WAN port or a LAN port on the router, and results can vary depending on which port the router wants to use for the uplink to the rest of the network. But getting back to my original question, in my experience, unless you have more enterprise APs that can create wireless mesh network, it makes more sense to have separate SSIDs for each AP as most devices don't jump from one AP to the other very easily. Now, Patrick, I'm going to give my answer here. That would simply be... <laughs> Use the same, seriously, use the same SSID. You don't need an enterprise AP. What will actually happen is as the signal strength drops off, if your client is worth anything, it will move over to the next SSID with the same uh, uh, encryption and password and reconnect. And here's the thing, if you have them all hooked up to the same DHCP server, it's not gonna have to re-authenticate and get another IP address. If you do it your way and go through the WAN port of every router, it's going to have to get a new DHCP address every single time, and your network isn't flat. Patrick? Well, it's great. If you want to manually log in and off of each router inside of your house, or have front of house router, back of house router, and then you're obviously changing the SSIDs, um, you know, I basically have two routers in my house, one in the front end, one in the back end. I don't run into a lot of the issues. Certainly people have uh, where it's not, you know, because in theory, right, it's very simple. I have a router. I buy the exact same router. I turn off DHCP. I connect this router into the, you know, one of the, the ports on the back of the first router, and we're good to go, and everything's natural and amazing, and I have all this coverage mm -hmm. in my house. So the reality is, is a lot of cheap routers don't do that very well. Right. right. So that also gets back to buy good routers, make sure the firmware is updated. And if you're looking for routers, before you buy one, see they've updated the router firmware in the last like 12 months or two years. For the three years old design and they updated it once, there's one of two things going on. Either they made it perfect or they don't <laughs> give a rat's delete expletive and you are dealing with aging, aging, aging code, which means given that they probably started it in this year, finished it in this year, maybe updated it in this year, probably never looked really deep in the security, 
you're yeah. straight into yeah. ta town. That's that's actually a really good tip. Look at the last time mm -hmm. they have an updated firmware. If it was three years ago, yeah, yeah. that's not the route for you. Yeah, hey, unless there's oh. an open source OS for the router, but that's a whole yes, other thing. That's, DDWRT, that's a, Gargoyle, but that's another yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> hey, hey, Brian, want to go to the next one? Now we've got one here from Warren who says, do you think Defender is sufficient for Windows 8 or should something like AVG be used, although AVG is almost a virus in itself these days? Let me answer it by saying Microsoft themselves have admitted that Defender has been deprecated. It's not going to protect you. That being said, Patrick, I, I only use Defender. I don't have anything running on my system. He only uses Defender. I only use Defender. Robert Heron only uses Defender. Almost everybody I know running Windows 8 only uses Defender. If you feel that you need a superior form of protection, spend all the money you, you want to. I would look at some of the reviews out there uh, before I automatically defaulted to AVG or Norton or any other brand because yeah. their performance varies and the, the performance of the, the antiviruses and the live scans and everything else and the protective heuristics that are attempting to find like virus-like behavior before it actually happens. It seems to be like every five years, everybody's tools go up and down and over. So see if you can find somebody you trust that does reviews uh, or just, you know, Throw it out in the wall and work with whatever works for you. Just find something that you can download for free. You know, my thing about viruses, uh, virus protectors mm -hmm. is there is no protection against you doing something stupid. If you are intent on doing something stupid with your computer, you're going to get an infection. There is no patch for human stupidity, yeah. which could also get into there is no patch for PayPal stupidity. <laughs> there is no patch for Amazon stupidity. There is no patch, you know, we could go, I mean, you know, it, it, it seems like every three weeks now we have another like, well, we thought the networks was secure, but it wasn't. So approximately all of our customers' data has been downloaded by some kid in Nebraska. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. Just remember, viruses don't kill people. people McAfee kill antivirus them. kills people. Oh, let's be nice. Mm, let's be nice. <laughs> let's go on to the third one. We Actually, this is not a question. This is a, uh, I, I'm going to call it a know-it-all. We've got something from Vivek, who was commenting on one of our Raspberry Pi episodes, who says that he's using a Pi as a web server using Apache, and it's also 100% green because he hooked it up to a 40-watt solar panel, a solar charge controller to seamlessly switch between solar and battery, and a battery so that it could run 24-7. You should definitely have that on the show. I'd say yes. The Pi draws so little power that it would be possible to have a 40-watt panel, a charge controller, and... I, like maybe a 2,000 watt battery supply that will run it through all the dark times. I would have to do the math, but I'm guessing yes. As long as you're not in like Sweden or Antarctica where there's very long extended periods of dark, like several days or months, you should be golden. Um, but yeah, it's actually it's amazing what you can do with super low powered devices and a big ass solar panel. Big highly ass language. solar panel. I Sorry. like that. Yes, <laughs> I like it. I like it. No, and, and Vivek, we're definitely going to have that on the show. And when we do, I'm going to ask for you pictures of your rig. Brian, let's go to the question number three. We have a question from Neil who wants to know why static? Now, first, let me say that I learn a lot from your show, but I seem to be missing a very important, important first step. Why do I need to learn about static IP address, subnet mask, and other stuff when my internet provider provides me with a router? Sorry for this basic question. I'm not trying to be mean-spirited in this question. Now, Neil, here's the thing. First of all, we like knowledge. Any knowledge is great. I want to teach people how to do things. Now, again, Patrick, I don't know about you, but I use statics just because I like to have a bit more managed network than just automatic addresses for everything. There are some devices that I always want to know where they live on my network. I know that my solar charge controller that I can access over my, my network is always at 10.10.1.6. I know that my router is always 10.10.1.254. What about you? I mean, okay, going back to the beginning of the question, there's nothing wrong with the router that AT&T or Comcast or any other internet provider gave to you unless it's a piece of cruft um, that's poorly updated, slow, doesn't have a lot of ports, or doesn't allow you to do things like, I don't know, you know, manage, have the ability to shut down. Let, let's, let's put together a perfect static IP mm -hmm. scenario. You have children. The children are allowed to use the computers. You don't want them to access the internet after 10 p.m. If you use a static IP address or assign it to the MAC address of the device, you can actually set it up so the router will no longer speak speak to their computer at a given time of day, or you can throttle their bandwidth, or you can throttle bandwidth across your house. There are a whole bunch of really cool things you can start to get into when you dig into 
the guts of your router. The problem with a lot of the routers from the, basically the, the router with the built-in cable modem that is designed to be super, super cheap and super, super easy to install and maybe, maybe, maybe isn't updated very often. Not that that's a thing for me. Um, <laughs> it seems to be a repeating thing for me hmm. on this show. But if you have that, one of the things you're running into is can I do cool things with my router? Can I use it to make things more efficient, more secure? Can I change the DNS to reassign it to something that's either more efficient for my for my browsing habits or gives me you know better security and control over what people are looking at? There's so many reasons to learn about this stuff. Static IP addresses are great because, hey, I want my entire network to operate as efficiently, as efficiently, efficientlessly as possible. I, I just want to be an, I want an inefficient yes. network. Yeah, let's, let's do just that, get that right out. now. Let's try that one more time. <laughs> I want my network to be as efficient as possible, and maybe that means assigning IP address to my home server, to the place where my you know, music files are held, so that I have less of the network looking around and going, I think that, oh, there's a server over there, and automatically going to an IP address and making things fast and simple. I also hardwire Ethernet most of the devices in, in my house, except for the laptops and the portables, mm -hmm. because then I have a guaranteed connection, amazing bandwidth, and I don't have to worry about how many uh, wireless routers are in my neighborhood. There's just lots of reasons to get into this. And it's okay if you don't want to, but we want you to have the information if you're curious and want to just take it to the next step. If you don't want to do static, I can't respect you in the morning. <laughs> oh, Padre. Yeah. Let's go to the last one. Go ahead and skip to number seven to the bench. This is actually a pretty good question from one of our uh, know-it-alls in the, uh, the group who had a test bench question. Oh, he has always had a test computer. Uh, he's always had a test computer, but he wants to, to up the game a little bit by playing with a test bench. He wants to know what is my best test, test bench setup for testing drives and equipment. Is there a better way than making a multi-bit USB drive to have your utilities at the ready? Is there a good way to build a multi-ISO SSD? Now, I answered this question in the community, right. but I thought maybe we'd start off small by uh, doing this little thing about Reusing ATX power supply. Ah, that one can <laughs> oh, stay down. Sorry. Now, here's the, here's the thing. You probably have a bunch of these sitting around your house. This is just an ATX power supply that I pulled from a computer we had down in the basement. We, we've got a lot of computers. I've, I've been yeah, down there. You've been, it's kind of scary. And most of the time, they go unused, right? right. But if you're going to run a test bench, Patrick, what, are, what voltages do most of the devices that you, you have run on? Um, 12 volts and um, 5 volts. Exactly. And... Any guesses about what voltages an ATX power supply will give you? Um, 12 volts and um, 5 volts. Exactly. And right. believe it or not, an ATX power supply is going to give you much cleaner power than any of the little right. wall warts or bricks that you're going to plug in. Yeah. And if you're going to have a permanent test bed, why not take one of those ATX power supplies, build it into your te test bench, and then clip these wires and, and use all the different plugs that you might have to connect to your devices? You know, you can spend a whole bunch of money on a dedicated power supply for your test bench, and it is cool and it is amazing. And I bought one like 10 years ago and then like used it twice and then didn't use it for like five years. And I thought to myself, everything's 12 volts, everything's fine. And especially now, if you, if you do like, there's nothing wrong with having a super cool custom, you know, power supply, but start simple, keep it simple, and you know, use whatever you have available. It's right. a nice place to start right. with like a power supply like this. Now there is a little trick. I don't know if you're gonna be able to get on this, Brian, but uh, if you've got an ATX power supply, it's not like the old PS that actually had a physical switch. The, this is triggered by the motherboard, but oddly enough, it's triggered by pins 14 and 15 in the ATX connector. So this is, is just, this is a, a paper clip. So I cut a paper clip. Is that UL it. approved, Padre? It's, this is absolutely UL approved. Now, if you want to be really pro, what you do is just wrap this in electrical tape just to make sure that nothing else falls in there. Yeah, you could also put a switch yeah. in there. You could put a switch, right, if you wanted to be, you know, like professional. Professional. Nah, I don't mind. <laughs> I don't, I don't do. but, but see, There's this... There's wrong with recycling paper clips. This will allow you to... Go ahead and turn on your power supply, even though it's not connected to a motherboard. Now, it's, it's a nice way to sort of reuse junk mm -hmm. that you've probably already got sitting in your basement. And a 400-watt power supply will power a staggering number of hard drives. Right, right. Now, Patrick, let's sure. get to it. We're going to be talking about FreeNAS. I know that you just did a FreeNAS episode on die trying, and it was, it was great. It was fantastic. We're a little... Uh, messier here on Know How, so I actually <laughs> got a many box. episodes of Die Trying. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you, no. I, I'm going to say you're you're more pro than we because this is just a junk box that again I pulled from downstairs. I believe if if this is a Core Two Duo, yeah, it's a Core Two this Duo. This is Creme de la Creme of 2006. <laughs> it's yeah, it's got a little age on it. Wait, wait, back off. 
Oh, what? <laughs> yeah, that's how you know it's used. Actually, here, uh, you want to grab that tag? The other way you know it's used is... Um, yes. Wipe, bad, reinstall. Yeah, so that, that's, that tells us that this was a machine that we were just about to, to toss out. There's, there's not a lot of good things about this machine anymore. Um, I've actually already upgraded the memory of... Actually, let's, let's be honest. It's still running. That's true. Yep. It's free. It's more or less clean. It's not being used for anything. And there's actually a pretty good amount of power inside of a core 2D. For yep. a basic server box, mm -hmm. there is more than enough going on here. Right, exactly. Now, if I wanted to build a gaming machine, I wouldn't start with this. But like you said, for something that's going to be a dumb headless server, why not? Absolutely. But this could rock Bejeweled. This could... <laughs> you could have a dedicated Bejeweled box. <laughs> I, I, actually, I, I bet I could run Candy Crush and Chrome on this. <laughs> but all right, uh, I've done a few things here. First of all, I've upgraded the memory. It used mm -hmm. to have one gigabyte of memory and 256 uh, megabyte DIMMs. Mm -hmm. I've upgraded to four gigabyte using one gigabyte dims. Now, uh, I don't know how you feel about this, but I always tell people, please, 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 if you're building a server box, don't buy bargain basement memory. I've seen that happen so well, many times. They save like five bucks buying the stuff on Amazon that maybe works for their box. There, I mean, there's there's a whole bunch of different layers I'm not going to get into here. It's like if you're building a high-end box, uh, one of the things I got roasted on when we did our free NAS build, people are like, you should have used ECC memory. You're <laughs> fools. You're amateurs. I'm like, well, I used what I had and could afford. Um, yeah, I, I don't go for barbing a basement. I go for branded memory. I buy a lot of Corsair memory of, you know, yeah. uh, you know I'll, I'll buy the house memory from a computer shop that I trust. You know. I also tend to, to recycle memory a lot. Yeah. You know, stripping old machines, what do I have? And I also say, max out the memory you can in almost any box you build. Yes. Uh, especially if it's going to be like, well, oh, it's $25 for four gigabytes or $30 for six gigabytes. Get the six gigabytes. Get the sweet spot. More yeah. memory always gives the operating system more room, more room to stretch room out. To stretch. Now, uh, other things that we want about this is, mm -hmm. yeah, just go ahead and pull out all the drives. You, you really <laughs> don't. In fact, I'm going to disconnect the CD-ROM drive here as well. Right. The reason why I'm doing that is because I want to have the ability to have a lot of drives mm -hmm. on my, on my uh, motherboard. Now, I could use something like this. This is an old silicon image SATA card, plugs into a PCI bus and it gives me two additional SATA ports. I could put two of right. these in here and get myself a couple of ports, but I thought, you know what? I I'm gonna go on the cheap. I'm gonna use the four ports that are already built into the board, which means, get rid of those. <laughs> I can't have anything plugged into my ports. Right. Now the good folks at home may be saying, but wait a minute, Padre, if you've got no hard drives or CD-ROM installed on this thing, how are you gonna install it? FreeNAS is designed and actually should be booted from a USB drive attached to a USB, well, port on the motherboard, not that's, on the front of the box. That's what this puppy does. So I've just got a USB CD-ROM drive. It's got the FreeNAS installation disk that I downloaded off of their site as an ISO and burned it. And then I've got this. This is just a standard USB key. This is a four gigabyte. Mm -hmm. You need at least two gigabytes to, to run FreeNAS, but right. I'm going to say use a four gigabyte. The reason for that is there's a lot of USB keys out there that say they're two gigs. They're not really <laughs> two gigs. They're that weird Surprise! accounting. It's close to two gigs. Right. It's got to be big enough for, for free NAS to be installed on. Now, don't install it on a hard drive. You can install it on you a could. hard drive. But if you install it on a hard drive, you're going to use two gigabytes of that hard drive for your operating system, and you cannot do anything with the rest of that hard drive. Right, right. So that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's part works. of the way FreeNAS is configured to be relatively secure, to boot off a separate image that is locked down and cannot be manipulated by hackers or fiends. And it, you know, just... just Save the hard drives for storing your data. Put the OS on the nice little USB drive, right. which is also kind of a line in the sand for older machines because if they won't boot off of a USB drive, you're probably not going to want to try to build it into a free NAS box. Right, right. So. Now, the other thing is I've got four two terabyte drives here, but um, unfortunately, this older power supply, I'm afraid, is going to blow up if I try to power them all at the same time. That's like a 300 watt power it, supply. Uh, it, but it, it's downgraded because it's been down. It's actually, it's I, dead. Like last night, I almost blew it Did up. you blow it up? Yeah. It is a 300 watt power it is supply. A but it, it doesn't like all those hard drives. <laughs> so what I did was I did our little ATX trick, and I am actually running this little array of drives, if you back out here. This little array of drives is, is run off of the uh, uh, an extra external ATX power supply that I'm going to turn on you right could now. if you wanted to install these inside of the case and I think you would probably if you weren't using this for other purposes put the ATX right. power supply inside right. of the case but I'm trying to go ghetto right it's now. very visual it's very visual right if it's you want to go ghetto we can get duct tape <laughs> no now if you could go ahead and just plug in that USB drive into the front port and uh, and power it up the installation process is actually really 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 simple this you just make part. yeah make sure that you're booting off of your CD-ROM drive I'm gonna Jump into my little boot menu, make sure that I, I am. There we go. 
And what I'm going to tell my computer is to go ahead and boot and take its instructions off of the boot CD, which I have burned from the FreeNAS site, which is right here. Ta -da! After this, there's only one more selection I have to tell it. I have to tell it to go ahead and install. It's going to unpack the package onto the flash drive, decompress it, and give me a really nice to read interface. And then there's going to be, but in between those things, there's going to be a lot of gibberish on the yeah, screen. Yeah, don't, don't try to figure out the gibberish. Now, <laughs> while this loads up, while this goes, I'm thinking maybe we should use this time to find out a little something about uh, a raid. We've got a pre-recorded video, Patrick. Cool. Um, what do you think we take a look at a I'm quick in. tip? If you've played the PC game long enough, you've probably heard about RAID, a redundant array of independent or inexpensive drives, depending on how old school you are. Now, if you are old school, you probably remember when there were really six levels of RAID, RAID 0 through 5. Uh, RAIDs 2, 3, and 4 are really just a historical footnote, so if you want to know about them, go ahead and jump over to Wikipedia. But we're going to start with RAID 0. RAID 0 was taking two or more drives and running them in what was called a stripe. I took those two or more drives and I alternated blocks between them so that they looked like one big drive. Now, there are some huge performance benefits from this. If I have two drives that seem like one big drive, it means that I could pull data from both of those drives at the same time when I'm reading, or I could write to both of those, those drives at the same time when I'm writing, effectively doubling the bandwidth I get in either direction. Now, it never turns out that way because of the overhead, but it's still a huge performance bonus. On the con side, when I have things in a RAID 0, which we sometimes call scary raid, it means if I lose one drive, I lose the entire array. Because the information is written across both drives, there is not a complete copy. If, I, if I, one falls out, if one dies, if, if one desyncs, I, I probably lost the entire set of data. So that's why we also called RAID 0 suicide raid. Now RAID 1 is not a stripe, RAID 1 is mirroring. So I take these two drives and I make exact copies of them. I, of, co of course, I'm going to need the same capacity on these drives. This has the performance benefit of being able to read from both drives at the same time. So I do get that performance uh, bonus like I do with RAID 0. But when I'm writing, I have to write the exact same data to each one, which does slow it down. Another disadvantage of RAID 1 is that Unlike RAID 1, 0, which looks like one big drive, RAID 1 takes the total capacity of the two drives and it divides it in half, because 1 has to be a mirror. Now, RAID 5 is, well, it's, it's weird. It's the first array that we're talking about that includes parity. When I have a RAID 5 array, I'm writing parity across my drives, which allows me to lose one drive and still be able to keep my array. In fact, I can have a RAID 5 array with as few as three drives. For example, if I were to make a RAID 5 array with four drives, I could keep the total capacity of three of them. In this case, I, I'd keep, what, six terabytes out of eight. And then I would just lose one in my, my parity use. That also means that I could lose one drive and rebuild the array from the parity information that's remaining on the other three drives. RAID 5 has sort of become a standard for use inside of network attached storage devices and enterprise class storage. Now there's also RAID 6, which is essentially the same as RAID 5, but I have two drives. I could lose two drives in the array before I, I lose the array. We've seen a bunch of hybridization of these RAID levels. For example, there's a lot of manufacturers that are running RAID 0, scary RAID, suicide RAID, but with SSDs. Because SSDs tend to be far more reliable than rotating storage, they feel comfortable in having scary RAID and still you know, giving you the performance benefit without worrying about data loss. For those who are ultra paranoid, we've got levels like RAID 1 plus 0 or RAID 0 plus 1, which can be a mirror of a striped array or a striped array of mirrored arrays. It's, it's a lot of different hybridization that you get from the manufacturers. Everyone from Synology and IOSAVE to Netgear have their own proprietary way of getting the most performance out of their individual product lines. Now, when we're speaking about RAIDs, we also have to talk about the right hole. That's W-R-I-T-E, hole. Quite simply, a right hole is that delay between the time a change is committed to array and when the information is actually written out. In that little bit of a delay, 
if you lose power, if you lose connectivity, if, if, if for any reason your array gets disrupted, you could lose blocks of information or even the entire array. This is especially problematic for RAID 5 arrays and uh, even RAID 6 at some points. Now there are some new file systems like ZFS which avoid the right hole, but it is something that if you're building an array from scratch, you need to be aware of. That's why I have all my RAIDs on a UPS, an uninterruptible power supply, to make sure that I don't run in to the right hole. Now that you know what a RAID is, Go build one. <laughs> I, just, I do not like talking about the right hole. I really it just it just sounds no. I'm not going there. Not going there. Okay, it's you know where we're safe you, to go with that one. You know where we should go. Let's go into the NAS box now. In the time that that video ran, it fully installed itself and it gave us this. You're not going to get a neat graphical user interface. It basically just gives you 11 options, none of which you really need except for shutdown. Well, yeah, and you don't need this. You don't care about. Yep. You, you need this number down here. Then you can unplug the monitor and never actually use this monitor again. Put it somewhere else. Use it somewhere else. Do it, just, just this is what you care about. And if you log into 192.168.1.115, we should have something glorious. Something yeah, so exciting. if you go to my computer, Brian, you're going to see we get this. Now, the very first thing it's going to ask you to do is it's going to ask you to change the password because do not use 1234. Give it something interesting like, oh, I don't know. How about know how? <laughs> no one's going to guess that. There Lock. we go. Oh, well, actually, you know what's good if you type it the same way. There we go. So now what we've got is we've got a, 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 a this is a fully reinstalled system. It's fresh. There's nothing uh, right. in here from any previous installations. Patrick, what's the first thing I'm going to do? So the username and password. Oh, okay. So uh, we're, I'm, I'm assuming that I'm going to go where? Uh, probably up to the account. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So I jump in. The, oh, look at that. I've got groups and users. Assuming I jump into an uh, ad user here. Now, why do I have to do this? Uh, because the people at BSD and FreeNAS said you had to do this. Okay. <laughs> yeah, actually, this is going to set up. This is where it's, I'm going to tell the free NAS, who right. should be able to access the volumes and the shares that are on my computer? I mean, it's essentially the glory of this is you have the ability to control who has access to what and what file systems and what areas of the box. Um, but you do that by essentially creating individual user accounts, either for everyone or one generic user account that you allow everyone to access. That's if you trust everybody in your house. But if you want to do things like have different parts of your free NAS where, let's say, the Padre has his mm -hmm. backup area and I have my backup area, and then we have a common area where people can upload files and transfer for things and another common area that's read access only so we can download or stream things you it all comes yep. down to setting up users right. um, so I've got I've got black robe added into my user actually if you see right here you'll see that that user has now been added this is also a place where I could delete users let's right. say someone moves on I don't want them to be able to access my my shares anymore I just drop them right out of here mm -hmm. now I've just added a user but I don't have anything set up on the drives yet, right? Well, you also have to set up a primary group, and I, to do that in the most basic form, would set the primary group and set that up as the wheel. So Black Row would be part of a group. Mm -hmm. So, we're, you know, what? we're going to call it the wheel. <laughs> Yay! So we've got a group and we've got a user. So, you know, if you're a sophisticated power user, you can use uh, Active Directory Server or Open LDAP and merge that in there. We're assuming since you're walking and this, you're not. Uh, but your next step is, generally speaking, to set up disks. So you've set up a user, mm. you've got an account going, and now we want to take a look at the disks. So we're going to go down to the Storage tab here, and I believe the first thing we have to do is set up a volume? Yeah, you're going to take a look at what, you can make sure your, your operating system, your FreeNAS install, can see everything. And somewhere in there should be the ZFS volume manager. Now, if you're using ZFS, I want to tell you two things. You want to have a fairly recent processor, and you want to have several uh, gigabytes of RAM. Now, right. we could argue about this, but generally speaking, I'm following what the FreeBSD community says, which is you have, you know, if you want to do ZFS, which is really cool, which is redundant drives, which is basically the ability to survive multiple drive crashes, you need a whole bunch of drives. You know, at least four. Um, ten would be better. Long story there. Let's not go into it. But you want to make sure you have enough memory and enough uh, computing power so that it does not take several decades for you to replicate right. the lost right. data. Now, this is bare bones minimum. This right. is four gigabytes of memory. That's actually horrible. I'd say eight is the minimum that I'd want to run. Mm -hmm. And I'd say eight would be my baseline. And then I would add one gigabyte for every terabyte above yeah. that baseline. 
If you are talking about building a, lo a less expensive system, you're probably not going to use ZFS. If you're recycling old hardware, you're going to use UFS. It's going to restrict the number of plugins you have. You also want to check out something called NAS for free, which is essentially another distribution or version. Like if you're familiar with Linux, you know, there's like Linux, but there's like this Linux and that Linux and the other Linux and Bob's Linux and Bob's Linux part two. Well, essentially free NAS kind of does the same thing. NAS for free is something a lot of people really enjoy mm -hmm. uh, if they're setting up uh, older hardware, less expensive machines, have less money to put into it. Right. Where were we? Well, we were talking about ZFS volume. So we're in the ZFS volume manager right now, and I've given it a volume name of KH. I could encrypt it if I really felt like it. I'm not going to do it on this one because I don't want it to take forever. But uh, Patrick, what's this little thing down here? Oh, boy. Slider. I just slide that all the way to the take it all. <laughs> Take all the space. Yeah, so we've got four drives in this array. I'm telling it to take all four. Uh, one, one of the things I really like about uh, about FreeNAS is it will tell you what is the optimal setup. So right now it's right. T telling me to use a, Z a RAID Z2. Uh, I'll get 3.63 terabytes of effective data, which means I'm using a hot, swear, a hot, hot spare and parity. So I right. could lose up to two drives of this array and I'm not going to lose any data. Which is a really beautiful thing. So, you know, if you come from the Windows world, you probably spend a lot of time ignoring the recommendations the operating systems make. Uh, in the case of FreeNAS, do what the nice operating system tells you to do unless you know better. Right. Now, we talked about scary rate. I could run this in a Stripe, and look at that. I get all the, the, the storage space. I get 7.27 terabytes, but of course, if I lose a single drive. I felt a disturbance in the forest, <laughs> as if someone lost terabytes of irreplaceable don't, data. Don't ever do this, please. I don't even know why they put that in there. You shouldn't be allowed because to select it. Some people, I mean, a free NAS box, an external hard drive, this is not a backup solution or system. This is storage, right? A backup solution is a copy on the system, a copy locally, and a copy stored somewhere else. So you have multiple copies of your data. So if the, your system falls down and goes boom, you have at least two copies of the data somewhere else, right? Yeah. Um, but... Yes. The, the only way, only reason why I could think of that you would want to use a Stripe is if you had multiple computers right. that were running that Stripe and you were bouncing across boxes so that you could get maximum performance. That's about it. Yeah. That's the I mean, only if, yeah. if you're insane, if some insane situation you're insane. where you're you know backing up for maximum performance and then doing a second replication for long term. It's, let it go. ZF, do what the nice operating system tells you, which in this case is ZFS two, and I think it is getting its it's writing its volumes. Yeah. So what it's doing right now is it's preparing all the drives. It's saying, okay, uh, I'm going to be using you as the spare. I'm going to be using you as the, the main data drive. I'm, I'm writing my parity across them all. This is actually where memory would really ha come in handy yes. and a fast processor would come in handy. If I I were to run this on like an old single core, that process could take uh, like Forever. an hour. Yeah, that's <laughs> not not great. But we're done, so we're ready to go. Now tell me, so I've got myself a, a, a volume. Where do I go from here? I would probably go up to the gears at the top that's labeled services. Mm -hmm. And we should be able to enable SIFs in there, which is what we would use to, yeah, click that on. And that's going to allow uh, OS X and Windows to see this box, to access the data on this box, to use it as a server. Right. Um, there's a ton of options inside of here, dynamic DNS and FTP, if you want remote access for it. Um, iSCSI, I don't think I'm ever going to touch, NMS, Resync. Um, this is like, a, <laughs> if, if you want to get an education in acronyms, install a free NAS box and start taking a close look at all of the optional services in there. But generally speaking, once I have SIFs uh, on, I'm pretty good. And then I'm going to go back to the, uh, uh, back to the, uh, uh, I want to say, <laughs> click, sorry, go to SIFs, click on the wrench, make sure all the settings are correct, and then we can go in and cool. there it is. I should point out that I'm talking and Padre's clicking, so if it sounds disjointed, it's yeah. because... There's, there's two two brains <laughs> going on here. Yeah. So, good. Do we want to change the work group? Do we need nah. anything additional yeah, on I there? think we're Description, okay with that. Description, FreeNAS server, UBA, log level, guest account. Um, we're not currently assigning a... No, we, you do have a static IP address signed to Correct. this. Correct. Right. Cool. So yeah. as long as I'm on the same network, I should be able to see this with any of my machines. Absolutely. As uh, long as they know the IP address of 192.168.1.115, they should all be able to get over here, no matter what operating system they're using. But first, they have to get on your network. But first, they have to get my network. And first, we also have to set up a share. Yes. Because we, what we've done is we've enabled the sharing service, but we haven't actually told the, the box yet who's going to access what and what volumes can they access. So I'm going to call this one... Uh, DIY, just because, you know, 
That's easy. Yeah, that's easy. <laughs> uh, the, one of the things I want to do is I want, also want to allow for guest access. You may not always want this. Right. Sometimes you're going to have a share. You may have a hidden share that you only want to be, mm -hmm. be able to access yourself. If that's the case, then please don't, don't allow guest access because if you allow guest access, mm -hmm. you're saying anyone on my network can get into this box. I don't care who sees this. I really don't care. And so I click that. And now, technically, since I've already, oh, oh this, yeah, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I wanted to go to the share, the volume that we created, which right. is know how. And once this is created, oh gosh, you know, I really wish I had a mouse. I should theoretically have access to that that uh, that uh, share. Yes. Yes, and you should be able to upload data to that share and download data from that share. This is always the moment of truth. When I log in, will it happen? Do I see it? Does it show up? Bam, and there we go. So what we've done is we've just created this. This is a 3.72 terabyte share on my free NAS box that I could load up with anything I want. Quick, upload something to it. Upload something oh, to let's, it. Oh, well, let's, you know what? I don't actually think I have it. Oh, you know what? Everyone needs the Firefox setup. <laughs> so there we go. It's, I think it's the only thing that uh, on my computer that is. Uh, uh, uh oh. Uh oh, wait. See, and I knew we shouldn't have done Oh, I didn't grant myself access. Uh oh. I'm a bad person. No, I'm you're not a bad person. person. Yeah. No. This is why, I mean, it's funny. There's really, really good detailed explanations up on the FreeNAS site that'll walk you through the configuration. Padre and I have both done this before, and we just made a basic <laughs> error that Noops. denied us access to the server we just built. Yes! Yeah. Um, now, we don't have much time left, but I right. would like to say one of the things that I really enjoyed about FreeNAS is that you can have it up and running in literally 10 minutes, yes. 10, 15 minutes. But there are so many features in here. I, I, I like to talk a little bit about the plugins. What are some of the plugins that you run in on your FreeNAS box? <laughs> Anything that allows me to share uh, musical files and access to my home. I don't know if you can pull in the plugins thing on there, but it should automatically have things like, oh my goodness. Um, there's a brain inside of my head that should be thinking about the basic fundamental tool used to share media inside of my home. It's on every single like server. DLNA. Right Thank you, DLNA. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really sad. Yeah. Uh, the Crash Plan plugin is really cool because it'll actually let us sync stuff off of your free NAS up to your Crash Plan account. You could account. run a torrent uh, Couch plugin. Potato if you're not into, uh, you know, the... Getting up. Uh, <laughs> that's actually really <laughs> funny. I was going to say XBMC, but there should be, if you scroll down a little bit, I think there might be a Plex plugin now, an XBMC plugin. Um, there's just an incredible, there's the Plex Media yep. Server available on there. Um, Transmission is a BitTorrent client. There's a bunch of really, really, really cool things you can do to set up on your free NAS box that'll run in the background. Um, bring this also back, the less powerful your system is, the fewer plugins you uh -huh. want running because yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And actually, remember, if, if you start loading up your system with plugins and you notice that your read and write performance starts to decrease, that's why. Because yeah. you've loaded down the CPU and the CPU has less time to handle all the, the writes across its drives. Now, one quick thing before we go, Patrick, and that is a lot of people are going to be tempted to say, oh, wow, this is awesome. I've got all these parts down in the basement. And they're going to they're gonna grab any drive they possibly can and drop it into the box. I would say no. What? What do you say? If you're doing it as an experiment, feel free to load any junk drive you have inside of it. If you want to spend money, start looking at greens and reds. If you want to be serious about a NAS configuration, go straight to the Western Digital Red Drives. Right, right. Um, that's just, you know, we could explain why, but we're actually out of time, <laughs> judging from the waving of fingers I'm seeing <laughs> from over on the desk. Um, but you basically, I run a lot of greens when I'm buying it, because basically, because I, I, bought, I bought all my greens before I have reds. I know. And the drives got the expensive, thing. and I stopped drying them. And as I'm replacing them, I'm starting to by uh, WD Reds. I have 32 uh, greens. 32. And now I, I'm thinking about replacing them with Reds. Take your time. I know. I know exactly. It's, it's, they're not bad drives. It's just no. Reds are better because they run cooler, they use up less power, they'll survive longer inside of a, a NAS array environment. And there's all sorts of other things. Yeah. Now, if you want to know more about FreeNAS, you want to know what we did and actually how I screwed up the guest right permissions, <laughs> please go to our show we, notes page. We screwed up. We screwed up. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a group thing. <laughs> go to twit.tv slash knowhow, K-H, and you'll be able to find all of our episodes and a way to download each and every single juicy episode to your device of choice. Your iPad, your iPhone, your Android tablet or phone, your, your PC, your Mac, whatever it may be, we're going to get you the goodness and... We're going to give you the best show notes in the business. Also, please.
please join our community at gplus.to slash knowhow. That's Google Plus. I know some of you don't like Google Plus, but I tell you, it is a vibrant, vibrant place. We've got almost 6,000 users, and we do everything from talk about future shows to present question and answer sessions to let you vent about your favorite project, your favorite operating system, your favorite whatever. It's a little bit of the something something that is part of the Twit experiment. Also, you can follow me on Twitter. Go to twitter.com slash PadreSJ. What's yours, Patrick? Patrick Norton. And follow him at Patrick <laughs> Norton. Follow us and find out what DIY people do on a daily basis. And finally, you know, next week, we're going to be showing you a little bit of love concerning a Raspberry Pi. I'm Father Robert Ballasare. Patrick Norton. Now that you know how, so do it.